for those who are new. Uh, I'm sure you've read the information on the website and it's fine if you do or don't have the book. We're actually a long way through at the moment and it's just a really nice book by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. The Bhikkhunis don't come with the book, but they do with my book. <laughs> so it has added Bhikkhuni power. And um, <laughs> and we're on the chapter called Settling Disputes. But really, all of these uh, teachings can be taken individually or they can be taken uh, as part of a chapter, part of a theme. Just as the Buddha's teaching, can, you know, you can pick up a book anywhere. My teacher going, she used to say, wherever you eat a cake, wherever you take the slice from, it's just as sweet. So uh, last week, we did talk about different ways of settling disputes. And people always love these settling disputes talks, because I guess this is one of the bains of our life, isn't it? Having disputes with people, not understanding what really happened. Were they wrong? Was I wrong? <laughs> And the Buddha's giving some beautiful advice. Some of these are also, I read through the whole chapter just before coming, and some of them are also do take strong action, do require strong action. So it's not that as Buddhists we have to always be um, completely passive and unbounded and let people walk all over us, but sometimes it's compassionate to um, address a problem and also to uh, reprove somebody who's doing wrong in the hope that they may change for the better and in the hope that they won't. Um, wrongly influence others as well and I think that's especially important in community so the whole theme of this book is about social and communal harmony so it's about looking at the way our actions and thoughts our views affect others as well as ourselves um, and it's amazing how throughout the Buddha's teaching he's emphasizing that self-awareness the way our minds work to understand how it is we create trouble firstly it starts in ourself and then we spread it around us and how to um, resolve those problems within ourselves so that everyone benefits as a result. So this is a, a really nice little uh, uh, excerpt, and this is from the Anguttara Nikaya 2, number 15, for anyone who wishes to read the full thing. Um, maybe the full thing, actually. Um, but it's nice to read these in, in the original books as well. It's a way in to reading the suttas for yourself. So I shall begin by reading through possibly the whole thing today, because sometimes it's nice to get a sense for uh, the balance of it. And this is particularly beautiful in, in that sense. So you'll see what I mean if I read it through and then we can have some discussion around it. So for the discussion, you can raise your virtual hand or if you can't find the bottom, some isn't at the bottom of your screen. I don't see many buttons today. Um, then you can just raise your hand on the screen and I'll come to you in due course. Your voice will be recorded in the recording, but um, if you don't want even your voice to be recorded, then uh, you can write a question in the chat. But it's only uh, our community, really, that watch these. And uh, yeah, you'll be pretty anonymous. Your video won't be shown. OK. So. Here we go. And this is called The Need for Self-Reflection, as I was saying in the beginning. And usually I change the word monks to monastics or to community. So I'll follow the same way I've been doing it before so that it feels a bit more inclusive that it's speaking to us. So this is about a monastery conduct. So I'll say monastics. If, in regard to a particular, a particular disciplinary issue, the monastic who has committed an offence and the monastic who reproves that person do not thoroughly reflect, reflect upon themselves, it can be expected that this disciplinary issue will lead to acrimony and animosity for a long time, and the monastics will not dwell at ease. But if the monastic who has committed an offence and the monastic who reproves them thoroughly reflect upon themselves, it can be expected that this disciplinary issue will not lead to acrimony and animosity for a long time, and the monastics will dwell at ease. And how does the monastic who's committed an offence thoroughly reflect upon themselves? Here, the monastic who's committed an offence reflects thus. I've committed a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body. 
That other monastic saw me doing so. If I'd not committed a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body, they would not have seen me doing so. But because I committed a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body, they saw me doing so. When they saw me committing a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body, they became displeased. Being displeased, they expressed their displeasure to me. Because they expressed their displeasure to me, I became displeased. <laughs> it's so human, isn't it? Because they expressed, sorry, being displeased, I informed others. <laughs> Have you ever done that? Get onto the phone to your friends. <laughs> Uh, I informed others. Thus, in this case, I was the one who incurred a transgression, just as a traveller does when they evade the customs duty on their goods. <laughs> Shirking out of the fact that they did something wrong by justifying it to all their friends. It is in this way that the monastic who's committed an offence thoroughly reflects upon himself. So it starts with the acknowledgement, doesn't it, of that misdeed. It must have happened because not only do you know that for yourself, someone saw you doing it. So there's no wiggle room. So we'll go on to the next one. Because both parties have to thoroughly reflect. And how does the reproving monastic thoroughly reflect upon themselves? Here, the reproving monastic reflects thus. This monastic has committed a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body. I saw them doing so. If this monk or monastic had not committed a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body, I would not have seen them doing so. But because they committed a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body, I saw them doing so. When I saw them committing a particular unwholesome misdeed with the body, I became displeased. Being displeased, I expressed my displeasure to them. Because I expressed my displeasure to them, they became displeased. And being displeased, they informed others. Thus, in this case, I was the one who incurred a transgression. Just as a traveller does when they evade customs duty on their goods. So even this person sees their transgression, maybe because of the impact it had on everybody else, including the person who proved. It's quite humble, isn't it, in a sense? It is in this way that the reproving monastic thoroughly reflects upon themselves. I like this theme of causality here too. Really seeing what led to what. So if monastics, in regard to a particular disciplinary issue, the monastic who has committed an offence and the monastic who reproves them do not each thoroughly reflect upon themselves, it can be expected that this disciplinary issue will lead to acrimony and animosity for a long time, and the monastics will not dwell at ease. But if the monastic who has committed an offence and the monastic who reproves them each thoroughly reflect upon themselves, it can be expected that this disciplinary issue will not lead to acrimony and animosity for a long time, and the monks will dwell at ease. Hmm. I find that very beautiful. And the thing that stands out to me there, the last paragraph, seems to be that it's really, in a sense, our responsibility to nip these things in the bud, not to carry resentment for the sake of the community. It's not just about two people having a fight, but the idea that that will impact everyone around them. And I think that's one of the things, you know, about trying to grow a community here in the UK that I find really important. You know, because if the people in the leadership roles and if there would be other people with me, if we're fighting, then the impact is even worse, isn't it? If it's coming from the so-called uh, people who are supposed to be setting an example, it, it really has a, a um, unstabilizing, destabilizing effect on the rest of the community. But even in a large community, I've seen it happen that there can be sort of 17 or 18 people living together in harmony and you only need one or two to be carrying on a dispute and all kinds of recriminations. And it really messes things up and creates an awful lot of busyness for everybody else as well. So I promise to come to Diana because she's only here for the first uh, while. 
So I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Venerable Tonda. Hi. Hi. Um, I am wondering about the reproving monk having committed a transgression or incurred a transgression mm. because of expressing his displeasure to the other monk. Right. That's what I'm gathering was the transgression in, of the reproving monastic. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, you know, are you not supposed, to, is it like, yeah. are you not supposed to say anything or is yeah. there another way to handle it? Like yeah. talk to the superior and don't talk to the person or yeah. that's, that's my question. Yeah, it's a great question because many times in the suttas, and you'll read it as we go through this chapter, it is encouraged to give feedback to our fellow monastics and to one another in our lives. But there's always some basic principles to be followed there. And one of the most important ones, I think, is that um, obviously that it's going to be beneficial as far as we can possibly tell and that it's going to be at the right time and it's coming from a mind of loving kindness and said gently as well. Um, but really the most important, I think, are that it's beneficial. And I think that has a lot to do with when we say it and how we say it. Um, and what I understand from this is that it isn't so much in the reproving that the issue arose. It's more in the consequences of the reproving. It's more what happened as a result. They're seeing that it actually didn't lead to very much good. And that person became more enraged and more perhaps um, resentful. And he informed others, that person informed others. And because of that, the reproving didn't, you know, achieve its desired effect. It actually created disharmony in the community. So this is why the person who was reproving has to look again at themselves and say, okay, well, perhaps that wasn't the best thing to do. Um, maybe they would do it in the same way again, and it would work out. But I think in this case, we're looking at the fact that it didn't actually have, it, it's more the consequences that are an issue. Maybe because the way that the reproving happened caused yeah. the other person to become displeased. Right. Instead of to say, you're right, I shouldn't have done that. Thanks for pointing it out. And yeah. then I'm okay. Yeah. yeah, because there are certain oh. um, people that the Buddha says it's not worth reproving. And if hmm. one would see that this person would always develop resentment whenever they were reproved, it might be a mistake to reprove them in the first place. Um, the Buddha says, you know, that to succeed in the training, you have to be willing to accept feedback and to accept it with gratitude, to actually welcome it, even to invite it. Um, you don't have to invite it, but if it's offered, you should be someone who finds it easy to um, receive. Because after all, if they're wrong about you, you can have a look at yourself first and really ask yourself, honestly, did I do something? And if you see actually they were wrong, I didn't have a bad motivation and then fine. You know, we don't have to become defensive and justify ourselves. The Buddha's teaching is all about knowing ourselves and being confident in our own um, karma, in the karma that we're making and creating. So even when we reproved, it might not be correct. But then if it's not correct, what is it Ajahn Chah said? Someone calls you a dog, have a look at your backside. And if you have a tail, you're a dog. If you don't have a tail, you're not a dog. <laughs> so I think learning to receive approval in a way, maybe with curiosity, you know, oh, okay, they see this in me. I wasn't aware. Let me have a look if they're right. This would be much more skillful. So it could be because of that, quite rightly. They became displeased and, and informed others. I think it's that whole sequence, isn't it? Because if you can be displeased, but you can work with it, you don't have to spread the negativity. But if you then go around informing everyone else, it creates just a huge deal out of something that was perhaps not such a big deal in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So people have said in the chat, is it because of the reprover's displeasure? Um, yeah, good point. Good point here. Yes. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think you're very right, actually. That person saw the person doing something unwholesome and became displeased and then reproved them. So perhaps they reproved them out of anger. Yeah, well pointed out. 
obviously sometimes we might feel irritated or angry or annoyed by something but the, again that's partly giving the feedback in the right time maybe it's about the right time for us when we've already worked through that initial irritation we've come to a genuine place of loving kindness and in other suttas here it says that um the ideal is to improve somebody out of sympathy for them you know truly wishing for their well-being and that's actually difficult to do because it's not pleasant to give approval so sometimes it does involve quite a lot of loving kindness and even self-sacrifice Whereas when you're doing it out of displeasure, it could be a kind of venting, couldn't it? It could be uh, a little bit less uh, of a self-sacrifice and more of an instant sort of release of uh, of anger, which can feel good. It can feel good, so I'm told. But you feel terrible afterwards. <laughs> so, yeah, it certainly wasn't fulfilling those basic principles of coming from the mind of metta and uh, perhaps doing it in a gentle and skillful way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And someone else is saying, uh, is it because the reproved and the reprover both spoke to others? So, yeah, again, it is the wider consequence of that incident that was uh, unfortunate there. And maybe that's more likely to happen, isn't it, if we do it with anger? It just nobody feels that they've been treated well. <laughs> so everyone complains to others to try and get others on side and heal their kind of wounded ego. <laughs> yeah super and here also if you go to the end of the sequence you know in the end it's because of the acrimony and animosity that persists for a long time and that the monastics won't dwell at ease and this is the real danger because the whole um, point of community in a sense is that we can support each other to feel safe to feel at peace to feel at ease so that we can be in solitude and then the solitude becomes a beautiful supportive solitude knowing that all your friends are there if you need them you know there are people to to help you there are teachers there are people taking care of your material physical needs and it's that dwelling at ease that enables the practice to deepen so if that is disrupted then the place doesn't become a good place of practice and people don't get the paths and the fruits you know, we've read many times in this book about uh, the monastics who did dwell at ease, looking at each other with kindly eyes, and they actually cited that as a cause for their deep insights and eventual liberation because of all that love and kindness that they developed between each other and because they were just so happy and so grateful to one another. They were full of wholesome qualities, and that led to wholesome states. Um. We have to be careful and very honest with ourselves when we want to give feedback. <laughs> and again, yeah, someone's making the point about the timing. And that's a hard one. I mean, certainly uh, for myself, I would say that most of the time I'm motivated by compassion, by metta, but, but my weakness is sometimes the impatience. So the timing might be off because <laughs> I prefer to do things sort of sooner. <laughs> and that's not always skillful so I think I'm trying to learn you know to to wait for a person to be in the right space to wait until you can maybe sit quietly or sit with them in a in a friendly way and and bring it up in a way that won't yeah won't kind of uh is less likely to to jar yeah and wait until I'm clear too yeah. Because sometimes we want to start speaking and we haven't really thought about what to say or the right measure and we just kind of start and see where it goes. But I think having some restraint around the things we do point out and how we point them out is important as well. It's a learning process. It's one of the hardest things. I mean, even more so than right speech, I think specifically giving feedback is, is very, very delicate. I don't know what other people think. Have you had success or failure with that or learned lessons along the way? Or I don't know if it's a big thing in the lay life. I mean, in monastic life, it's something that's really part and parcel of, of uh, the lifestyle. Most of the time in our monasteries in Perth, we're encouraged not to give feedback at all. 
And even at the end of a, a, a rains retreat, we invite feedback from the Bhikkhu Sangha. Everybody who stayed in that place invites feedback from their own community as well. Um, <clears throat> and you always ask for forgiveness for anything that's been seen, heard, or even suspected. But no one ever gives it. They just go, yeah, well done, well done, well done for asking. And then that's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> which is I don't know it's probably for the best because you're in a public space it'd be embarrassing you know but I personally would approach my team always do even at the end of the day I must get fed up with me you know I always say oh is there anything today or is there, is there anything please forgive me if I... and he's like nothing <laughs> He, he just won't go there you know he always says there's nothing but it's also because I'm inviting it all the time so nothing builds up right which is nice yeah any more comments or anything here or shall we continue to the next lovely sutras? yeah please thank you for being here Diana bye <laughs> lovely to see you all right so the next one <clears throat> is avoiding acrimony. And this is also from the Anger to Twos. In fact, they seem to all be from there, mostly. Monastics, when in regard to a disciplinary issue, the exchange of words between both parties, the insolence about views and the resentment, bitterness and exasperation are not settled internally, it can be expected that this disciplinary issue will lead to acrimony and animosity for a long time and the monks will not dwell at ease. Monastics. When in regard to a disciplinary issue, the exchange of words between both parties, the insolence about views and the resentment, bitterness and exasperation are well settled internally, it can be expected that this disciplinary issue will not lead to acrimony and animosity for a long time and the monastics will dwell at ease. So here it's not enough just to um, remove the tension from the outer community and uh, settle things externally, but also we have to look that we're not carrying it in our mind, you know, because sometimes we can, um, we can feel that we've said all the right things, done all the right things, but still it bothers us. We have remorse or we have resentment inside and... Uh, of course, if that's the case, it can it can sprout again next time you see that person, which is, I think, one of the reasons that the Buddha says when we practice loving kindness, we should do so in public, you know, in the way that the last to explain, but also in private. So we can think about that person in a kindly way and that will minimize the chances that we kind of dwell in our grudge and our kind of uh, grumbling mind. So someone's asking, what is meant by insolence about views? Uh, we were talking about that earlier, and I think it's uh, obviously around fixed views, feeling one's right or feeling, you know, one one maybe shouldn't be reproached. But the insolence to me is um, probably about expressing their views rather rudely and rather uh, forcefully. You, you know, I'm right. And what, what do you mean? Well, your view is ridiculous. That kind of thing, you know, putting others down, perhaps being insolent. Yeah. My mum used to say I was insolent sometimes as a teenager. It's that teenage stroppiness, isn't it? <laughs> you can't tell me. That's a ridiculous thing to say. How dare you? <laughs> of course we're right. We always think we're right. Um, this seems not only to apply to monastic life. Absolutely. Otherwise, this book would be kind of... Uh, yeah, you wouldn't be able to sell it, would you? It wouldn't be published because monastics can't buy it. <laughs> so I think this relates to everybody and it's just using examples of uh, particular for, uh, formulas that we use quite frequently in monastic life, but that will apply to any kind of um, community life. And we all live in community. We're, none of us are islands. So uh, I think it's great that we can learn from the Buddha directly by using the examples that he lived with and lived by. And hopefully it's inspiring to see that um, monastic life is not so different from lay life either, that there will be insolence of views, there will be kind of resentment and bitterness, exasperation, because putting on a robe doesn't take those things away. <clears throat> and if anything, when you're living around other people, perhaps from very different backgrounds and cultures and 
different ages, all kinds of different expectations about life and how things should be, how people should be, then you're going to rub up on each other. So it's actually very challenging living with people that you didn't choose to live with. You know, in the lay life, of course, there can still be a lot of heartbreak. You choose your partners, it doesn't go right. You know, we're born into families that are supposed to love us, but somehow we feel the love wasn't as unconditional as we wished. Or maybe sometimes we even experience abuse from the people who are supposed to care and protect us. So, you know, there are lots of problems there as well. But I think on the whole, we choose our friends. At least we choose our friends, right? We choose the people we live with. In monastic life, we don't to the same degree. Of course, if you're building a community, then it's important to make sure you're all having similar ethics and similar um, understanding of monastic life. And it, there's a click, you know, there's a feeling like uh, you can be mutually supportive to each other as spiritual friends because that's going to promote everybody's practice. But um, of course, it's about widening the circle of your loving kindness. And sometimes accepting people who might trigger you in some ways. You can't go home either as a monastic. You can't go home from the office and like go back to your family and friends or have a coffee. <laughs> You're there all day, 24 hours. <laughs> Very important not to let things fester. Mm. Anything anyone would like to say about that or shall we continue? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I like this one. This is great. Because it's just so real. It just feels like this is how people have always been. And <laughs> this is recognizable now. So this one is called mutual correction. Okay. And the Buddha's using the words bad and good. And I think he really means ethically. People who are kind of following the precepts expected of, of monastics and people who are actually quite off track, people with bad intentions. And of course, those two categories aren't um, uh, fixed. It's more about behaviors than any intrinsic sense of someone being good or bad. Monastics, I will teach you about co-residency among the bad and about co-residency among the good. Listen and attend closely, I will speak. Yes, Bante, those monastics replied. The Blessed One said this. And how is there co-residency among the bad and how do the bad live together? Here, it occurs to an elder monastic, an elder or one of middle standing or a junior, should not correct me. And I should not correct an elder or one of middling, middle standing or a junior. If an elder corrects me, he, they may do so out of, without sympathy and not sympathetically. I would then say no to them and would trouble them. And even seeing my offence, I would not make amends for it. Similarly, if one of middle standing or junior standing corrects me, they may do so without sympathy and not sympathetically. I would then say no to them. I would trouble them, and even seeing my offence, I would not make amends for it. It occurs too to one of middle standing or to a junior. An elder or one of middle standing or a junior should not correct me. I should not correct an elder. And even if I'm seeing my offence, I would not make amends. In this way, there is co-residency among the bad, and it is in this way that the bad live together. Hmm. So no one trusts each other, do they? They don't even trust that when they're corrected, it's coming from a good place. So they just completely refuse to accept it. <laughs> Whether they're elder or not. And this is kind of key in monastic uh, life, because usually an elder should be humble enough to receive criticism or correction from a junior. But generally speaking, the elders have the duty of admonishing or correcting, guiding the juniors and it's considered a very bad conduct if um if there's that irreverence towards the elders especially those who are wise in the community so it just goes in every direction they don't really give a hooties do they <laughs> they don't give a hoot whether you're a senior or junior just no one should ever correct me so you can see that's a kind of 
obstinacy and you know maybe that's also a kind of insolence of views I should not be corrected and they sort of say I won't correct anyone either so that the other one won't correct them it's like let's all just do what we want <laughs> and, uh, and then we can yeah continue to follow our unwholesome intentions uh okay i'll come to the question in the box in a sec because we're going to go for the good side now which is usually the opposite and how monastics is their co-residency among the good and how do the good live together here it occurs to an elder monastic an elder and one of middle standing and a junior should correct me i should correct an elder one of middle and middle standing and a junior if an elder corrects me, they might do so sympathetically, not without sympathy. That's nice because they're giving the benefit of the doubt. Thinking the best. I would then say good to them and would not trouble them. And seeing my offence, I would make amends for it. Similarly, if one of middle standing or a junior corrects me, they may do so sympathetically, not without sympathy. I would then say good to them and would not trouble them. And seeing my offence, I would make amends for it. And similarly, it occurs to one of middle standing or a junior that they may be corrected by an elder or middle standing or a junior, and that they should correct them. And they should correct anyone else. Seeing their offence, I would make amends for it. It is, it is in this way that there is co-residency among the good, and it is in this way that the good live together. Hmm. You can see that sort of mutual deference there, like thinking the best of your companions, that maybe they're coming from a good place. That's so nice, isn't it? Because I find in myself, you know, often when we're not enlightened, we often are coming from a pretty good place, but it won't, might not be a perfect place, you know? Yes, sure, there might be a chance that we're doing it without sympathy, but it's most likely that we're doing it with sympathy, even if it's not 100%. And just giving that benefit of the doubt and looking for the goodwill there is already very um, harmonious, at least to harmony. And it doesn't trouble the other person because they won't worry that maybe you'll misunderstand. Mm -hmm. Makes it easier for them to approach you. Okay, I'm coming to Madeline, who has a question, and then I'll come to the chat. Can you unmute? It's not a question, actually, okay. um, Venerable. Uh, I, yesterday, I was listening to, on Audible, about the stories of the Buddha's great disciples. And Sariputta um, was reproved by a very young junior monk one time for not having his robe on correctly. There was a little bit of it, of the under robe hanging down incorrectly. And Sariputta said to the, the young monk, a child who corrected him said, Venerable, your, your robe is hanging down incorrectly. And he said, thank you. You are my master. Yes. I will take advice from you. And immediately um, fixed his robe. Yes. I just thought that was just a terrific little story. It is, isn't it? Thank you for recounting that. It's a lovely, lovely story because the Sari Putta, the Venerable Sari Putta, for those who don't know, was the Buddha's right hand uh, chief disciple and the master mm. of wisdom he was the one most developed in wisdom the buddha said he had the same wisdom his was equal and no different to his own wisdom and uh, he was such a beautiful graceful monk you know everything you read in this beautiful book the great disciples of the buddha highly recommended yeah. um it really brings out their humanity and the, the all the disciples differences they, they they have their own characters their own personalities and uh, that one really stood out as a great example of how to receive feedback. And that's another beautiful thing, isn't it, about receiving it gracefully and graciously, is that we're actually presenting a teaching for others. We're setting a good example of humility. I mean, the more so-called advanced you are, and this is why Ajahn Brown likes to talk about the path as not attaining but disappearing, the more humble we should become. Because we genuinely want to understand where we can improve, right? And also the Venerable Sariputta knew that he was coming, that novice. It must have taken a lot of courage <laughs> to say that. In fact, you know, last reigns, it's a totally different story, but um, there was a monk whose robe was like really hitched up. And I thought, 
I just have to tell him because it looks a bit, I mean, if it was me, I would probably want to be told. And another monk said, no, don't say because he always has his robe hitched up. And I said, yeah, but not that much. Uh, so I did say, um, and I felt good about having to say, even though it was a bit like I wasn't sure if he really appreciated, but at least, you know, I knew it was coming from a good place because I just figured I would like it if someone told me. So he just, I think, shifted it a bit and there was no issue. It's like you look out for each other. It's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I tell Ajahn Brown that he's got like baked beans on his robe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being cheeky now <laughs> but I won't go too far you know <laughs> no it usually ends there you know with the baked beans and because he fries his eggs both sides so luckily there's less likely the egg will, will fall in the robes it's very difficult with these robes because they all like have they have loads of I don't know if you can see they have kind of uh pleats you know it sort of scrunches up like that so things can fall. You can have your dessert here, your mains here, your soup here. <laughs> so it's kind of nice if we're told. And also, if you ever see me with like something in my teeth, you know, that's embarrassing, isn't it? No one says, and you've been like giving a dumb talk, and you've got like chocolate in your teeth or spinach or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the other question in the box is, uh, does this become a criteria, a selection criteria when looking for someone looking forward to a monastic life? Yeah, I mean, I think if you really have the intention to practice sincerely, whether as a monastic or as a lay practitioner, whatever, as long as you want to walk the path, I mean, it involves self-examination. You want to know, you want to change, you want to become more aware of the ways that you um, perhaps don't act skillfully <laughs> believe it or not all of the time you know or don't speak skillfully all of the time so we have to want to change and there has to be a certain level of trust in those that we want to train with that they might have gone through some of the steps we haven't yet gone through it's not that they're better or like they've got all the answers but they may have gone through the training that you're about to embark on and they may have some wisdom to share so it is important because you know it's like with anything when you've been in it longer you kind of know the potential things that can later become a problem if they're not nipped in the bud or um you can know for yourself what helped and what didn't and how you've changed over time so but there's a fine line between that and sort of controlling another person. So, yeah, it's ideal if somebody's really genuinely open to that feedback. And certainly if um, it, it becomes clear that they're not and that they do have so many strong views that it becomes hard for them to change, then it may not work in the community, right? I mean, it's like in any relationship, if you can't compromise, if you can't hear one another's perspectives, you're not going to be very happy. It's going to be kind of all take and not much give. So I think for monastic life, it's not even just about the trainer and the trainee. It's about the whole community and how um, the kind of example you're setting. I mean, we're trying to create like mini societies, really, that run on along democratic principles and principles of mutual respect, but also respect towards elders, which our society, I guess, and culture is largely lost. Um, and this is respect towards elders in the spiritual life. It's not based on age or gender or race. It's based purely on practice and how much training we've had, you know, how we've worn away some of the um, unwholesome qualities in our minds, un unwholesome, unskillful habits. So um, it can be very beautiful. And if uh, someone's not benefiting from that, if someone's not able to... Uh, receive that uh, that feedback then it's unlikely they're going to get the benefit go very far in their practice so yeah it does become a kind of criteria but you know it's not like you see a person you make a judgment straight away and it should be both ways I mean one of the things that sometimes happens is people ordain people that they barely know and it doesn't serve either party necessarily because if you don't really know the relationship you're getting into it's a bit like a quick decision to get married to somebody it may work right it may work it can do I mean arranged marriages can work and you know love at first sight can work but it's more likely that you if you develop a strong friendship over several years 
when you see each other through some ups and downs and different conditions, it's more likely going to create a long lasting bond. And that's also not a guarantee. But yeah, we have to be willing to work with ourselves and give other people the chance to change. Right? Yeah. But sometimes it might not be a fit. It might not be like very compatible and you don't want to, a person have to change their personality. It's not realistic. <laughs> and it's just, you know, better they find another community or a different way to practice. That's also okay. <clears throat> so we need lots of communities. It's one of the reasons, you know, sometimes people say, oh, there's not many bikunis. Why don't they all just lump together and live in one big place? Well, they all might have different approaches to practice, different uh uh, teaching styles, different training backgrounds, that's very, very, it's usually inevitable among the Bikuni Sangha because we haven't had that long under the same training um, guidelines because Bikunis haven't existed long. So we've always been, we've, most of us have been practicing decades before we even entered the monastic robes. So there are going to be differences. And I think that's great too, you know, because some people prefer like a place that emphasizes discipline. Some people prefer a place that emphasizes suttas. Maybe some prefer a certain tradition. Sometimes you just prefer a certain teacher or a certain group of people, a certain environment. And I think it's great to have a choice. So that's what we're trying to do with this bikini project. Just give one more option because there is no choice even for full ordination in England which is very sad. So I, I remain the only bikini here so far. <laughs> and uh, that's a shame for me because I'd like to be able to apply these principles in everyday life, you know, with other bikinis as well. It'd be lovely. Yeah, I think that's how the community living can be a massive boost to the practice. You miss out living as a hermit. You might think you're doing great, but then what if you meet someone you really get triggered by you have to live with someone you have to compromise maybe it all goes out the window it's good to have those checks and to check that you're good in solitude as well so yeah you're not too dependent on having people around good so we're doing well today we well we're always doing well whether it's a lot or a little but uh if there are no more questions at the moment or comments i should really say comments because i prefer comments you do some of the some of the teaching as well. Uh, and then we can continue. Anything? Anything from people here? Okay. So oh Madeline, I'm coming to you. Sorry, I, I don't mean to kind of um take too much time but in my You're in one welcome. of my jobs i was um i was an hr in an academic institution and it was in the 1960s and we had to institute appraisal and it was it was something that the academics utterly resisted but if you have a very good system where pe people are <clears throat> approached with great respect and you ask the person how do you think your work is going mm. and you elicit um, from them how they think their work is and how they how could you improve you ask them uh, instead of going in and telling them what they should do and what they shouldn't do yeah. because people will really learn to change their behavior if yeah. they're asked how do you think your behavior is Wonderful. you know are you happy with it are you yeah. do you think it needs improving mm -hmm. so it's a skill it's not anything yeah. that's terribly difficult you just need to be intelligent and open and Okay, although we didn't use those words in those days, uh, compassionate, but um, you have to be you have to be respectful most of all, and it mm. worked fine. It was you know they they took to it in the end. Beautiful. Uh, there was a bit of dragging to the water, but in the end they hopped in and swam about. Yeah, so it um, can easily be done. It needs, right. it needs a right a right approach, mm. and. Um, the expectation that this this can happen. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. It's interesting that you said it took a while because maybe during that while it was building the trust, you know. Well, they didn't want to do it because they thought in academic life, we how can you assess our work? We're academics, but... <laughs> yeah. You know, but yeah. of course um, it was a requirement of the government which did help. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, they had to they had to do right. it in the end. Yeah, and maybe over time, when people see that it is actually beneficial. Yeah, they did come to see this as was beneficial. Mm. It's a long time ago. 
yeah um but yeah that's yeah. great it's a great approach because what you're really doing is getting people to self-reflect and that's the it's whole the, point of this system, the, isn't it that we have to be able to yeah it's the only way to do it. You, you have to be able to encourage somebody to self-reflect otherwise it's it's pointless really in yeah. my view yeah 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 good anyway i won't say any more tonight thank you no no you're welcome to say more <laughs> there's no quota please feel free <laughs> it's very valuable to hear from you so all right um i shall continue let's uh do the next paragraph this is also oh this is a big one actually we can go through it some of it at least so this is about accepting correction from others so and this is the venerable Mahamo Galana and he is the left-hand monk if you want of the buddha so the buddha had two chief disciples the sariputta the venerable sariputta was the uh foremost in wisdom they were both fully enlightened so they both got immense wisdom you know you can't really qualify it but the Mahamogalana's special quality was uh, psychic powers is this that one yeah this is this is really dramatic is it that one anyway okay <laughs> getting you excited so the Venerable Mahamogalana is addressing the monastics. Friends, though a monastic asks thus, let the Venerable Ones correct me. I need to be corrected by the Venerable Ones. Yet if they're difficult to correct and possess, as qu and possess qualities that make them difficult to correct, if they're impatient and do not take instruction rightly, then their fellow ma monastics think they should not be corrected or instructed, and they think of them as a person not to be trusted. What qualities make one difficult to correct? Here, a monastic has evil desires and is dominated by evil desires. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Again, a monastic lords themselves and disparages others. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. <laughs> I think this is such a human tendency. We don't even realise we're doing it. This is a quality. Oh, sorry, yes. Number three. Again, a monastic is angry and overcome by anger. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. Again, they are angry and resentful because of anger. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. Number five, they're angry and stubborn because of anger. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. They're angry and utter words bordering on anger. Number seven, when reproved, they resist the reprover. Number eight, when reproved, they denigrate the reprover. That's very common, isn't it? When reproved, they counter reprove the reprover. <laughs> I see some of you smiling. I think that's the really funniest because we all do this. It's like, well, you did this. Well, but you did this. Ah, I didn't do that. What about when you? This is really what you call an argument, isn't it? It just goes backwards and forwards. Yeah, it makes it just horrible. <laughs> when reproved, this is interesting too. When reproved, they prevaricate, lead the talk aside and show anger, hate and bitterness. <laughs> politicians anyone notice <laughs> um i'll just go through them i see someone has a hand up hang on so they prevaricate lead the talk aside and show anger hate and bitterness hmm. they don't answer directly when reproved they fail to account for their conduct and number 12 when a, mon a monastic is contemptuous and insolent, makes them difficult to correct. 13, envious and miserly. 14, fraudulent and deceitful. 15, obstinate and arrogant. There's a lot of defilements going around. <laughs> and number 16, a monastic adheres to their own views, holds to them tenaciously and relinquishes them with difficulty. This is a quality that makes them difficult to correct. These are the qualities that make one difficult to connect. 
It's interesting that view is often in there, isn't it? You know, it's one of these very difficult things. If you think you're right and you know you know best, you're not going to listen to anyone else. So I'm coming to uh, unmute. Yeah. I realise I shouldn't say your names because then you're not anonymous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I was just thinking on number nine, when reproved, he counter-reproves the reprover. Yeah. Uh, that reminded me, I think in one of the earlier suttas in the chapter, there's a part where the Buddha says about when you should give um, feedback on someone's misdeeds. And he specifies you, you should make sure you're innocent of it yourself. Mm. But they might say, please look at your own uh, conduct first. Right. And I wonder if that could be considered the same as counter-reproving the reprover. Right, yeah. Well, I mean, it's ideal if when you reprove, you don't have that fault yourself. Um, but with some people, even if you reprove them on one thing, they'll want to improve you on something totally different, won't they? They'll bring anything up <laughs> to kind of put you down and make them feel better about themselves. So, I mean, certainly it helps if you're not being hypocritical in the first place. It's, you know, you're less likely to have somebody object, perhaps. Um, again, as um, someone else had said, it's nice if you put it as a question, maybe, rather than a, you seem to, you've done this. <laughs> you know, explain yourself. Could be, well, did you notice? Or, or how did you feel at that time? Did you mean to be disruptive? Or <laughs> were you aware? <laughs> um but yeah in my experience I mean I have unfortunately had experiences when I'd I've had to uh find it quite difficult that's probably why I say unfortunately when I've had to give feedback and I have felt that I've given it very gently very reasonably I've explained my motivation you know I've praised them first and closed it with praise and they just throw all sorts of stuff coming from every angle that you could never envisage and things that maybe have been resentments for a long time that you didn't realize they had. And, and sometimes it just seems like uh, someone having a tantrum because they don't want to hear anything. Um, yeah. I mean, in one particular case that I'm thinking of, I didn't even really reprove them. I just said, well, in our tradition, we do it this way. So I'm a little unsure about that, doing it that way. <laughs> um, and it was just a big tantrum. So yeah, I mean, certainly we can try our best, but it seems to me in this case that um, this is talking about people who really won't take any any feedback and it's maybe to identify those people so that um, we can avoid some of the trouble that we maybe shouldn't bother going to. And here it is saying that these qualities in the introduction, it's saying that they um, cause the fellow monastics to think that that person can't be corrected or instructed or cannot even be trusted because of that so um but certainly we have to you know the other sutta was saying we have to analyze ourselves as well as a reprover uh, still not a perfect thing <laughs> you're never going to avoid someone blaming you even if you come from pure loving kindness even the buddha was blamed wasn't he for all kinds of things he didn't do even Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> I'm just kidding there, because obviously the Buddha's the Buddha. But, you know, he did something wonderful for bhikkhunis, but some people don't like it and try to say he was badly motivated even, which is ludicrous, because there was really nothing in it for him other than feeling that he could live with himself and do what was ethically right. So I think, you know, it's so important. I mean, even with... um this new property that we're wanting to get for the sake of the community and to help grow the community, there's a very tiny couple of people who who sort of felt that, oh, it was a bit too big or it's a bit too luxurious. It's just a house. I mean, it has to be a certain size and, and don't understand where we're coming from. So, you know, people do sometimes misunderstand our intentions and there's nothing we can do about that. But if we would let that stop us doing something really wholesome, that would be a terrible shame. So I think sometimes we have to accept that not everyone's going to like what we're up to or not everyone's going to understand. But if we go on the right track and we keep on doing things from the best of our intention, given the conditions and other factors, then um, in the end, sometimes people come around. 
And at least we can be happy with ourselves. Slight. That was a slight um, add on to your actual point, but I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Liz, can we come to you? I, um, I would like to add something to that because in fact, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. It's, it's cold as well in France, you see. <laughs> And um, that is that the Buddha said, be your own island. Uh, if you don't meet somebody who is like-minded, uh, go as a rhinoceros on your own. So there is a bit of a problem there because uh, you can still feel well, I am right, because, uh, and I have my own refuge, and so on and so forth. So it's very easy to kid yourself. Yeah. And it, you've got to be very, very careful to examine yourself um, honestly, because there are things, I mean, obviously, that we are not uh, uh, going to see eye to eye with a lot of people. Mm. And uh, and you think, well, you know, if I take this sutta, that sutta, and so on and so forth, I'm right. And uh, yes, you see where I'm coming. It's yeah, really easy to, to plant yourself and make a big mistake with the, the best will you, you can master. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. I fully agree with that. And um, one of the safeguards in the Sangha, one of the ways it's organised is that generally... Um, you wouldn't go off independently until you've trained for at least five years. And that's not even including your years of, as an Anagarika or as a Samanera or Samaneri. So you would have a whole year in the community, serving the community, followed by a year at least of being a novice on 10 precepts, basically still in training. And then even as a fully ordained monk or non, you would have five years with your teacher. And I have always sought to have that. And even now, even though I've had many more years than that, 18 years in monastic life, I still want to have a teacher because it, because precisely because of that danger that we may think we know <laughs> and we think we're right. But even if you are, oh, you, are. Beginning, you can still go off track right if you're just alone for so long at the very least you might become out of touch with regular people in society maybe people's means or you know how much you're really contributing or whether you're teaching in an appropriate way according to the situation according to the conflicts that are happening in the world you you need to be able to keep in touch um with things and the two quotes you mentioned are actually quite off center in the suttas they're like less likely to be i'm not saying they're not authentic they may well be but they're i think the the one of the rhinoceros is from the sutta nipata and i think the other one the island to yourself is from the dhammapada i think yeah I'm not wrong but they're very rarely stated and i think that the island one was more stated in terms of it's better not to keep company with a fool. That's it right. wasn't so much an encouragement to go off on your own if there's a better situation of being in community. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've translated so, it yeah. that. So we have to be careful with those teachings. I completely agree. And um, and that's why the Buddha made a sangha that would be dependent on lay people. So even if you would be on your own as a monastic, you would still be accountable to the lay people in that you have to receive your meal from them every day. Mm. So yeah. they're going to notice pretty quickly if you're really up to no good. Say if you are actually really corrupt, and it happens, right, that monks might even be having mistresses or they might even be gambling. I mean, unfortunately, you hear about these things. Mm. But, um, perhaps more so in countries where they kind of felt they had to go into robes and they stayed in robes for some reason or another. Maybe it's, you know, a good livelihood or maybe it's stigmatic to leave. Um, and it can happen. And you're going to find that out if people are going on arms round, and if as lay people, you also do your duty of, you know, asking questions. I mean, here when it talks about eld being corrected by elders, juniors and, and et cetera, the lay community also have to sometimes question the monastics. Ajahn Brahm always says he's a monastic open to scrutiny, which I think is beautiful. Mm, you can mm. ask anything you should be able to ask anything so that's very important otherwise mm. you become one of these wild hermits 
you do have these people i've seen them in burma they're called visito visito or something and they go off into the jungle and they have these crazy hats like coming up at the side and high at the top. <laughs> and uh they just live foraging i guess and some of them have wild eyes you know they go <laughs> and uh I don't know, it's easy for Westerners to especially to project, oh, they must be a wise, crazy wisdom, something. But they're actually, I think some of them have gone slightly mad because they don't have that kind of um, safeguard of society to keep them on track. There is an incident which has really marked me, you know, saying, be careful. Uh, Ajahn Sumedo, in one of his books, he, he speaks... Uh, about uh, going for a long retreat in the jungle and so on and so forth. And he said, uh, I, I had so much meta, I let the, the mosquitoes uh, settle on my arms and so on. And he said, I thought I'm close to enlightenment. And he came back to the monastery. And within very short space of time, they're speaking about minutes, maybe hours, but no more. Uh, another monk made a remark and he said, I felt this rage. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I laughed when I read that. And I thought, yeah, be careful, because I, I do tend to go off on retreat on my own. I haven't yeah. got wild eyes. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is easy to kill yourself. and yeah. to yeah, you, you need other people to put you You're back right. on the right track. Yeah. Yes. And also an important point to that, just to close this particular little thing, because we're coming close to the end, is um, to, to refer to the Buddha's teachings, because there's so much overestimation, uh, especially among people who do it, I guess, for, I don't know, maybe it's to do with how goal driven you are to some extent, but Sometimes people think if they've been practicing a while, they should be getting something. So then they start kind of redefining the word jhana, redefining the word enlightenment. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if they feel that they haven't seen any overt hindrances for a while, they think, oh, maybe I'm enlightened. But the thing is, you do have the Buddhist text to read, and the Buddha's there mm. as your guide. And if you're really honest to that, that is a safeguard. I mean, he's not diluting things there. I think this craving that we want to see goalposts, we want to feel we've got somewhere, is really dangerous. And it can be especially common, maybe not to be too gendered, but it can happen a lot with male monastics. There's this kind of gung-ho, like, okay, I'm in the forest. And even Ajahn Brown, he constantly talks about all these super monks, you know, <laughs> it's like this idea of this like super monk who sits for hours and, oh, they didn't, you know, they could be burnt alive and they're... And uh, the fire didn't touch them. And yeah, some of it's inspiring, but after a while I get a bit fed up with these super monks because, I mean, women also practice quite austerely. I mean, I was in Myanmar for four years with no mosquito nets or repellent or anything, and sleeping on a, a floor. And, you know, some of it's fine, but I mean, it's not the practice in and of itself. You have to have a balanced practice and uh, maybe women are less likely generally speaking to go off into extreme austerity because we still bring a softness to things but um yeah I think that sometimes with this like gong-ho kind of okay enlightenment or bust kind of attitude it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit dangerous isn't it and it's good to get the yeah. energy checks yeah, but yeah. sometimes being on a retreat, huh, I, I call it a kuti, it's a very small cabin in the wood, yeah. and I stay there for a week, two weeks, and my health is not too good, so I can't yeah. stay more, longer than that. But um, uh, it does me good, it quietens the, the mind. Of course. Uh, the main thing but, is you can integrate it when you come back, you know, that you have people around that can you can check in with and you know if you start to go kind of off track and it'll build up to it as well you know you mm. wouldn't just start as a beginner going off for like two three months you you build up to it over time mm. uh, yeah let's see if we can just come to a place in this we might want to end here because we are nearly out of time actually um but I'm just wondering if we've ended in a, a suitably wrap wrap up place um I'll just read the counterpart to that. I'll just read through it because this was what happens when you're not easy to correct. And now it talks about um, the opposite. So I'll just read through that to end, yeah? So friends, 
So this is when we don't even seek the, uh, the feedback. Although a monastic does not ask, let the venerable ones correct me, I need to be corrected by the venerable ones. Yet, if they're easy to correct and possess qualities that make them easy to correct, if they're patient and take instruction rightly, then their fellow monks think that they should be corrected and instructed, and they think of them as a person to be trusted. Sounds much better, doesn't it? It's like it's really quite nice when it does the stark kind of opposites because it just lands differently in your body and your mind. And one kind of makes you a bit, bit ooh, ooh. And I notice in my body when I read this, it's just so lovely. It feels settling inside. What qualities make one easy to correct? Here, a monastic or any person has no evil desires and is not dominated by evil desires. This is a quality that make them easy to correct. A monastic or anybody does not lord themselves or disparage others. They're not angry or overcome by anger. They're not angry or resentful because of anger or angry or stubborn because of anger. They're not angry and do not utter words bordering on anger. The danger of anger and the beauty of metta. Again, when reproved, they do not resist the reprover. When reproved, they do not denigrate the reprover. When reproved, they do not counter-reprove the reprover. When reproved, they do not prevaricate, lead the talk aside, and show anger, hate, and bitterness. When reproved, they account for their conduct. Again, a monastic is not contemptuous and insolent, not envious and miserly, not fraudulent and deceitful not obstinate and arrogant. Again, a monastic does not adhere to their own views and hold to them tenaciously, but relinquishes them easily. This is a quality that makes them easy to correct. Friends, these are called the qualities that make one easy to correct. <laughs> so that's lovely. I'm glad I read that part because it felt almost like a little checklist for myself like a little manual of how to train, you know. Okay, so when I'm reproved, I'll try not to resist the reprover and not to denigrate the reprover, not to counter-reprove the reprover. It's it's stuff we do, but we haven't really listed, written down for ourselves probably. Um, but I think that serves as a really good checklist, especially for people in training, whether, well, in anything. I mean, obviously, I'm speaking from monastic life because so is the text and that's what I'm living. But I'm sure that works equally in the workplace with the boss, you know. Sometimes, of course, they might be wrong. But do you have to reprove them there and then? Maybe you can reprove or counter reprove rather. Do you have to come back at them there and then? Or maybe you just show them through your work that they were wrong. I don't know. Yeah, maybe the boss had a bad day. And maybe you're just so sure that what you're doing is coming from a good place. It doesn't matter what people say. I think that's also very beautiful when we're really aligned with a good motivation. You know, nothing can get us too much down. Sometimes I get down if somebody kind of questions my motivation, thinks I'm coming from somewhere I'm not. But in a, in a way, it just makes me more... Um, uh, what's the word determined in a sense to align myself properly with that motivation and really make sure of it you know for myself and then I think you've done your best so <clears throat> is um I guess that's the end of the uh the sutta class for today um next week there isn't one because I'm teaching a meta retreat which sounds very um very relevant now after all those issues that can come around through anger uh meta is a great antidote it also makes us feel safe and trustworthy and trustful i think of other people so i'm going to be teaching that and in the meantime they'll still be the silent sittings the the chanting meta chanting on wednesday and then i'll see you back for a sort of class in a couple of weeks so i do hope you can join it's been lovely to have new commas i'd love to hear how it was for you hope you enjoyed it and uh am i to ask minori to say a few words on the upcoming things so if you can have a few more minutes to close. yeah so first about the the all these teachings 
um, uh, offered on a donation basis, as you know, in the spirit of generosity. And all these teachings are available in the YouTube and uh, there's a there's a Facebook as well. In the YouTube, there's 6,000 odd subscribers. So it goes to the wide world and um, there's 652 videos to that. So uh, you can see, you know, this is a small community. You can see like few people, but it goes to the outer world. So that is what we are supporting. And with your generosity, um, this will grow into a bigger place. And of course, uh, about the new property we were, you know, talking about, um, we we are, the main need these days is to acquire the new property because, um, you know, the the, Oxford property has outgrown, uh, uh, so there's no no way of growing from there uh, other than going into a new property. So there is a property that uh, the Anukampa is considering, uh, and it is very close to Oxford. And uh, we are doing the initial processes just before putting an offer. We've got some generous offers for interest-free loans now, but what we need now is more donations. So um, we want to kind of, you know, uh, tell that to you as well. And uh, if you are able, um, please donate uh, through the normal channels. I just put a link there. And uh, other than that, the long term, there's a calendar for food dana. Uh, um, you can do direct debits. You can do uh, so many other ways in helping. You can uh, check with the team at Anukampa project if you have any special skills. Um, so there's there's so many ways of um, working with Anukampa and uh, sharing these teachings to a wider world. And uh, as you know, the BSWA as well put lots of um, uh, Venerable Chanda's teachings there. So it, they've got lots of subscribers. It goes to much, much bigger um, audience than 6,500 um, mm -hmm. subscribers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Manoi. Apparently, if you do subscribe to the channel, it's also helpful for getting these talks heard. And that can bring in more support as well, because really our two charitable aims are to have this training monastery for women who want to ordain. Uh, that's why we need a bigger place, because of the seclusion. We don't have seclusion in Little Terrace. You know, normally monastics have kind of huts, outdoors at least. We might not have a big forest, but at least we'll have a big kind of back, backyard and it's bordering some forest as well. Um, and the other aim is to spread these teachings of the Buddha, basically, through um, mainly through bhikkhunis, not only me. And uh, the other thing that uh, we are looking for at the moment is people to come and stay. Um, most of the year is probably covered, more or less, but there's still some gaps and there's still times when we only have like one guest and uh, we do have space for two or three. So if you want to come and stay for some time, I know some of you are like in Costa Rica, it's a long way to come, but... <laughs> and for the men and transgender folks non-binary folks we have like um we only have one guest room when there's another bikini there's two rooms upstairs me and the other bikini who's visiting next year will stay there and then there's just one guest room so usually it's two women in there but then there's like um a sofa bed in the lounge which Matthias has stayed on and we had another lovely man staying on last week he was happy with that it's quite comfortable so everyone's welcome so we hope to see you somewhere soon. And uh, even if we only see you here, it's wonderful. It's very supportive and uh, beautiful to connect through this Zoom medium. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I uh, wish you a very good night. Or if it's the middle of the day, I wish you a good day. <laughs> Take care and we'll unmute you now. We'll stop the recording and then we will say goodbye. <laughs>